Okay, so as I said, I want to just um, quickly jump into this presentation and start talking about um, Mount Keith. So I rocked up as the as the new technical services manager in Mount Keith back in in 2002, and WMC in those days had a very interesting process. Every single competent person had to get together in a in a meeting to go through their resources and reserves every year, and this meeting was happening about um, two weeks after I started work at Matt Keith. So I was putting together the slide pack, which was normally about 100 slides or so. And I started looking and comparing last year's estimate to this year's estimate, which had been done by one of the guys who worked for me. And I looked at this long projection. And I'll just ask you to have a bit of a look at it and think about what you can see. You can clearly see that the um, area that's covered is a bit bigger because there's been more drilling done. So that's, that's good. But there's something else in there that's a little subtle. And you may not be able to see it, but if you look at the bottom picture, you can see that there are small shapes just hanging down off the bottom of that long projection, which don't exist on the one from the 2001. That's a dead giveaway of what's going on here, which is that uh, during the estimation process, they've managed to get the rotations on their search lists incorrect. So in the, the first estimate, the rotations were running down um, at, a slight, at a, probably about a 40, 45 to 50 degree angle. In the second estimate, they've rotated them to vertical. So these are the types of mistakes that can happen. But let's think about what was going on here. Now, at the time this um, happened, Mount Keith was recognized within WMC as being the best reconciling operation they had. Um, it was often bragged about that they had a, about a 99% reconciliation, which for people who didn't work at Mount Keith made them very annoyed about things because they were sure something was going wrong. And they were right. So if we look at the next slide, on the left, you'll see <coughs> there's a uh, little table that says the ROM to mill reconciliation. And yep, sure enough, there you go, 99.4% of, of, uh, of the grade reconciled. The only trouble is, if you look on the right, there's something that says 125% reconciliation. That's the mill to resource reconciliation number. And nobody ever paid any attention to that. It wasn't tracked every month. Nobody looked at it. It only happened once a year at this one meeting where people looked at that number. And there's something else interesting about that number, which is that it's greater than 100%. So anything that's greater than 100% has to be good, right? Hmm. Okay. The only trouble was that uh, that was saying that the mine, the resource model was actually over predicting what the mill was getting by 25%. So the consequences of that sort of thing I can just get on the next slide, was that uh, this operation went from being the best reconciling reputation to the worst re reconciling reputation. 40,000 tons of nickel that never existed um, had been in, this, in the schedule. That meant there was a one year reduction in the life of one of the stages of the pit and a production gap of six months between two of the stages. So when the nickel price was at one of its historic highs, we were actually treating low grade stockpiles and not making much money at all. That then had flow and impacts into the amortization rate and reputational impact. Um, and it was really a fairly dramatic time. You can imagine me giving my presentation to uh, all the senior managers and executives in WMC. I stopped at about that slide where it said there was 125% reconciliation. And we didn't go much further from that. And these are the types of errors that you can get, and they can really have a big impact on mining operations. The thing, the thing is here that these mistakes and errors that I'm going to talk about in the presentation are not unique. Um, they happen all the time and we get this history repeating over and over and over again. Um, we take that combination of people and processes and data, we mix it all together and we get our models together. But then we have this one really big problem, which is how do we measure the results? How do you know if you're doing a good job or not? Particularly if you're in a, uh, a case where you're not mining the thing. And it's, it's really difficult to know whether we've put good models together. So I think one of the things we can do is look at things that have gone wrong and get lessons from those things that have gone wrong and try not to do them ourselves in the future. So kind of some of the flaws that you have, and I'll talk about some of these as we go through the presentation, but I think the biggest flaw we have is us, people. Um, it's most of the time it's about you and me as people. And these ideas that we have to save time or to make improvements, 
or even more dangerous, this idea that we have that we're exceptional or that our deposit is unique and different from everybody else's deposit. Um, those start us thinking down the wrong paths. And I deal with that sort of thing all the time. Um, overconfidence, just mistakes that we make as human beings, um, and our ability to communicate to other people what these models are about. We forget sometimes that we're sitting in the midst of doing all this work and we understand in great detail what's happening. We pass these models on to our customers and they have no idea what's going on. So how do we actually deal with that sort of stuff? How do we actually make that happen? Uh, make it so that they have a better understanding of what the models are useful for and what they're not useful for. If we move away from people and we think about the technical front, I think the technical side of things is actually the easier part for us to, to understand and to deal with. Um, and it really starts off with the data. If we get the data right up front, you've got half a chance of getting things, uh, of getting a good model. The second part is the geology. So I've put this little diagram together there that shows you know, we need to have the right amount of data. We need to make sure it's not poor quality. We then need to have a good geological concept that sits in behind that data. Um, and we may need to make sure that we don't take that geological concept and just stuff it up in the, in the process of modeling things. So those two are my first two go-to points for not getting a disaster in my resource estimation. Have I got the good data? Have I got enough data? And do I understand the geology of things? After that, you start to get into the more technical side of things. We start talking about the search neighborhood, checking and checking and checking again, and making the reports and documents legible and, and usable. The actual stuff that goes on in geostats, I think is actually a distant cousin to everything else on this stuff. Um, you can make some, some fairly broad assumptions on that geostatistical area and not stuff things up terribly. But if you get the data wrong or the geology wrong, or if you get the search neighborhood wrong, you're going to end up with a bad model. The thing is that this stuff is all interconnected. Um, <clears throat> the geology and the data flow down the path into your domains and the parameters that you're using. And you end up with these compounding errors that just grow and grow over time. And it gets to the point where you almost lock yourself into a bad solution. Um, we have these cognitive biases in the way we think about things. And those biases tend to come back and hit us at the end. It makes it very hard to understand where we've got these compound errors happening. And you'll see that in a couple of the examples that I'm going to talk about as we progress. So how do I actually go about identifying the risks associated with this stuff? Well, sometimes they're pretty obvious, okay? If you're experienced in this stuff, you, you start to understand what to look for and you look for those subtle things like I did on that Matt Keith example where you could see the change in the orientation of the, the grades and the blocks on things. Um, sometimes you need to be a bit creative to explain to your, your supervisor, your boss, what's going on, because they're not necessarily resource modeling experts. They don't really know what's going on. They, they need this presented to them in a very clear and simple process. Some risks are a bit subtle though, and you have to be a bit creative and think outside the box to find them. Um, one of the things that, that has annoyed me recently is that I've seen resource estimation almost being put into a checklist type um, process. These very strong workflows where you start at this point, you just go to the next point and the next point and the next point without thinking about what's what's happening. And I think that is um, a fairly dangerous thing to do. Without thought, you can make lots of errors in resource estimation. One of the other things you have to do when you're looking at risks though, is you have to look beyond the common metrics. I mean, we're all probably pretty used to looking at, you know, what's the average grade of the resource versus the average grade of the drill holes. We're also probably used to looking at things like swath plots, which are very useful tools, but sometimes you need to go a little bit beyond that. And you need to understand how estimation works at a fairly fundamental level and what tools you've got to investigate how those things um, uh, come together. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And most importantly, as I said on one of those previous slides, watch out for that my deposit is different stuff or my deposit is special. Um, always signals to me that there's may be something going on here. If you think your deposit is different from every other deposit and therefore needs to be treated differently from estimation, then you're going to have to prove it to me. You're going to have to show me in great detail why that is the case and why it's not uh, uh, possible to do something in a more standard fashion. So the critical qualities for success in this stuff is making sure you've got a good toolkit which I think this is where Datamine uh, Studio RM comes in for me, and making sure that you can actually use those tools. 
the thing I like about Studio, and uh, you know, it's interesting. It's been Studio or DataMine has been around for 40 years, and I just uh, quickly did a calculation. Then I've been using DataMine for about 32 years, so that makes me about 80% competent on on using the software, I suppose. Um, but the thing I like about it is it is actually a one-stop toolbox. I can use it for just about anything, uh, and if you know how to push the right buttons on the thing, you can get some really interesting results out of it. So let's start off with the first problem, which I talked about was being data, making sure you've got the right data and uh, uh, making sure that it's good quality data. So here's a picture of an open pit. This is a, a case that uh, um, I dealt with as part of a, a review uh, be about eight or nine years ago now. And this company called me in to just review all their resources to have a look to make sure that they were they were uh, suitable for reporting under the JORC code. So <clears throat> I had a look at their open pit, and they gave me all the data, and I started looking at this this drill hole data. And this is colored by um, uh, drilling type. So the green is blast holes or percussion drilling. The red is uh, um, reverse circulation diamond drill holes, et cetera, et cetera. And the first thing I do when I look at this sort of stuff is I look at the statistics. And you can't look at statistics for me without looking at a histogram. So I tend to use the tools that are built into Studio for that sort of thing. I look at the, the histograms that you can um, pull up in, in Studio. And here's an example of this. This is all the data. You can see the mean is uh, just under 0.6. You can see the, the coefficient of variation is pretty high there, sitting at 4.6, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. From then, I start dividing the data into um, different drilling types. So I want to look at the diamond drill holes. And the mean of the diamond drill holes is 0.7, coefficient of variation 4.6. Same thing with the percussion drilling. Ah, hang on, the mean's gone up a bit, but the CV has gone down quite a lot. What's going on there? Something strange happening in this. And then you look at the reverse circulation drilling, and you see the CV is, is back up again. Etc. And then I look at all the uh, the diamond and reverse circulation drilling, and the CV is quite high. So that process of just stepping through the drilling types really clearly highlighted that something was strange with that percussion drilling, that open hole blast hole drilling. Um, the CV was very low. Looks a bit strange. So from there, I sort of circled the wagons and and uh, started looking at it. And one of the things that that you can do quite easily is you can highlight different data types in the histograms versus the spatial location in the uh, the graphic window in, in Studio. And that's all I've done here is I've looked at the, um, the histogram and I've grabbed those blast holes you can see in yellow there on the, on the right hand side and looked at those in relation to everything else. And when you do that, it highlights them quite nicely in these histogram graphs. Um, and you can see that uh, the mean of that data looks quite different. It's got a mean of 1.1, where everything else was less than, less than that. So it starts to highlight just from very simple data analysis. And we're not talking about rocket science here. This is pretty simple stuff, okay? Just comparing data across, looking through things and seeing what it looks like. And you can see that there's something wrong with, with that data or something unusual with that data. So the next question you ask is, how do they collect these samples? <clears throat> and here we go. These uh, samples that look very strange, they're blast hole samples. But then you go and look in the pit and you see those blast holes and you look and say, well, what are they sampling? Um, I've actually got a video of this, this happening and you can see water shooting out of the top of the, the mast of the rig and stuff slopping around everywhere. And this, this, this poor guy has been given a piece of poly pipe to sample it and he's using it as a very inefficient shovel to shovel, shovel it in these bags. So the blast hole sampling was effectively useless. Um, I don't know why they were bothering to do it. In fact, it's the first time I've ever told a client to stop. I just said, stop doing grade control because it's not helping you at all. So why would you bother doing it? The thing here is that um, identifying these sort of data problems is actually pretty simple to do, okay? You need to monitor what's going on. You don't need to just go through the motion. These guys knew there was a problem. You know, they, in their own resource report, they said that 50% of the, the samples had less than a relative, a relative difference worse than 10%. So 50% of the data was, was really very, very bad, but they didn't do anything about it. It took somebody to come along outside and, and say to them, well, you know, you're just wasting your time. Why bother with that? Now, these types of problems are very, very common. You get data problems everywhere and you always um, 
come across and they lead into problems with the interpretation, the domains, the bibliography, the whole thing. The trouble is that nobody knows what to do about it. Nobody likes to throw away drill holes, okay? So what do we try to do? We come up with these solutions of factoring things. And I want us to quickly just touch on factors because it's the next one of my, my pet hates in resource modeling, resource estimation. And there's lots of classic cases about factors around the place, but um, here's one that some people may recognize the slides on. I, and I won't tell you exactly where it is, but we had a resource estimate, which is that top left-hand image there. You can see there's, there's grades being estimated in a resource model. The bottom left-hand Im image, though, is um, a series of factors that have been applied to that resource model. And you can see they range from a factor of one up to a factor of 1.43 or 43% increase in, in the grade. And those factors were done on, on a, a, a range of different parameters that the guys came up with. They said, well, you know, in this situation, we're going to use this factor, this situation, we use that factor, this situation, we use that factor. Lots of work done on this, lots of, of investigations, lots of analysis, lots of experiments, all that sort of thing. Um, but nobody really stopped to think about what the implications of these factors were. Because the, the biggest factors ended up being applied in the areas with the least data. So think about that for a minute. The biggest factors applied in the area with the least data. Well, that's where we're less certain about the grade, isn't it? And yet we've applied these big upgrade factors to that. Those zones just happen to be the deepest in the pit. So what's happening then? We've taken grades that were estimated originally to be fairly low. We've increased them by 40%. Naturally, what happens is the pit optimization then drives down onto those higher factored grades. Where's the risk associated with that? It's a high risk strategy, these factor things. And why is it a high risk strategy? Well, you know, this operation went from being supposedly a million ounces a year to maybe 700,000 ounces a year. There's a 30% reconciliation problem. Um, the construction of the entire operation was based on, on, on loans that were backed by hedges. And you can imagine you're not getting 30% of the ounces that you've hedged. You have to buy the, that uh, gold to deliver it back into the, the system somehow or other. This very nearly bankrupted this company. It came very, very close. Um, and yet, strangely enough, the conversation I had when I was pointing this out to the, the CEO was he started out with saying, right, we know there's nothing wrong with the resource. Everything was pointing somewhere else. They didn't go right back to the beginning and think about these factors that were being applied. The trouble with factors is that um, there's lots of different ways to get to the same answer, okay? You can do lots of things. You can adjust the drilling grades. You can adjust the block grades. Um, you can do them through some sort of post-estimation approach. But you, if, unless you look at the distribution, and I'll come to that in this next slide, um, there's more than one way to get an answer. I'll stop on this slide just for a minute and have a bit of a think about it. If you look down in the bottom right-hand corner in blue, it shows the mean grade of these graphs above 40% and the amount of metal. So if you're reconciling on grade, for instance, and you know through whatever process that um, the grade is actually 73% or whatever it is, 73 grams if you're really lucky, um, and yet your raw data is showing you that the grade is 66, how can you get 73 as your grade instead of 66? Well, you can do three things or four things. You can multiply by some sort of a factor. You can change the variance of the data. You can just apply a mean shift. All these types of things you can do. So there's more than one way to get the same answer, which is the problem with doing factors. One of the problems. The other one is, do you apply it spatially? Do you apply it globally? How do you do it? Um, and we don't know how to do that sort of thing. Essentially, what we're saying when we're factoring stuff is that we don't have enough knowledge. We don't understand what's going on. So I'd really avoid factors at any, any chance I can. I want to rush through a lot of this because I've got a lot to, uh, to cover. So the next thing is onto some geology. So I'm a geologist, and I think that means that uh, as a geologist, we need to treat our models and our deposits with respect, understand the geological processes, recognize that things flow from those macro scales through to micro scale, look for fluid traps and pathways, these types of things. Quick example of the sort of stuff that can go on with, uh, with geology stuff. This is a fairly trivial, trivial case, so I'll rush through it. Um, we had a client who had uh, bad reconciliation at their operation. And they used to model their deposit with just one domain. Um, and 
everybody knew that the grade was quite variable. So they had these lower grades on the edges and a higher grade in the middle, but they just modeled it as one domain. And this was the sort of thing they got, a swath plot. Now, of course, you can do these swath plots in, in Studio these days, so that's a, a very handy thing to do. And if you look at that, you can see that there's quite a big gap between the block grades and um, the composite means. Even where there's a lot of data, there's quite a big gap. So something was going wrong, and of course, it's the domain problem. We talked to them and we said, well, let's go and uh, change it and actually put in a higher grade domain in the middle and lower grade domains on the edges and see what happens. This is the sort of thing you would do. And all of a sudden you end up with a different sort of swath plot. Those grades come back and match much more closely. As I said, a very trivial example, but domains and getting the geology right really does drive the quality of that resource estimate. If you're going to have a catastrophe in your resource model, you can almost go back and point to not having the right geology, the right domains. So recognizing, in this case, recognizing that geology-driven driven domain improved their reconciliation by 15%. These guys were actually going to close the pit. It was going to stop mining, even though they always knew they were getting more metal, but they just didn't know what was going on. So being too conservative is actually just as bad as being too aggressive on things. All right, on to my, my next case. Sometimes we may not have the geology, so we've got grades. You know, this is often, often happens. You see people have not done the logging or no one's got a clue on what's going on. You still, I think, have to have some sort of geological context. This case was, um, was really quite interesting. Uh, I got a call, it was actually during the last data mine geology users group meeting we had in, in Noosa back in 2018, I think it was. Got a call from somebody saying, Scott, have you got some, some time you can have a look at our deposit, maybe come and do a review on the, the uh, resource model for me? And of course I said, yes, come along and have a look. And uh, I started having a look at things and they showed me two different resource estimates. And here they are. This was on the left-hand side in red, the initial feasibility study interpretation. Nine months later, the same people were doing a, the grade control model and somehow or other, the geology had changed by 20 degrees. Things had rotated 20 degrees, okay? And the, the, those lovely long strike lenses that were in the feasibility study had ended up being in these little short discontinuous lenses on things. So something was going on here. They hadn't stopped and actually looked at the geology before they built that initial resource model. Absolute tragedy. You can imagine what's going on here. This company ended up going into receivership. Um, they end up stopping and having to, to work their way very slowly out of that, that, uh, that financial trouble they're in. They're up, up and running now and not doing too bad, but uh, it's an example of the sort of things that can go wrong. One of the things that, that I like doing with this sort of stuff is using Studio to help identify these types of problems. Um, not following recipes, but looking for patterns in the geology, looking for continuity, rotations, distances, all those types of things, understanding what's going on. And if they'd done this sort of stuff in that last case, they might have had a chance of avoiding some real tragedy. So I want to talk quickly about some of the tools that I do for that sort of thing. The first one is stereo plot. And if you look back about three slides, you would have seen a stereo plot up in the right-hand corner. You can do that sort of thing in, in Studio, of course. You can do the same sort of interactive data selection and filtering and seeing um, categorical data, all that sort of stuff. One of the other tools are some of the new implicit modeling tools that are sitting in Studio, uh, where you can do categorical models or grade shells or the vein tool. And I have to say my favorite tool at the moment in Studio is, is CoCrieg. Um, not so much because it's got new functionality compared to Estima, but because it's fast. And that opens up a vast panorama of things you can possibly do with uh, uh, looking at quality of resource estimates and things. I absolutely adore Kokri. So here's some ways I've used it. I build something as an implicit modeling tool, okay? You can do indicator creaking and use indicators and or uh, something I call a zone of influence, which is effectively a nearest neighbor. So if I look at this case here, this is the same case of that rotated 20 degree ore body. Um, what I've done is the drill hole data is on the, the left-hand side, and then the zone of influence approach. So that's involved looking at uh, indicator um, variograms, 
at, I think this was about a 0.3 gram per tonne or something like that, to get an, an indication of the, the orientation of the mineralization, um, along with just spinning the data around, looking where the, the orientations are. And then looking at the indicator variograms to give me a size of the range of, of, uh, of grade pods at that sort of scale. And then creating a model using Co-Krieg, just as a nearest neighbor estimate, around those each drill hole that had a grade that high. And when you compare that sort of thing, uh, hopefully you can see that on the bottom of the screen there, but the comparisons are actually pretty good compared, compared to the resource, uh, sorry, the grade control drilling. That work took five minutes. Okay, so five minutes to go from drill holes through to um, that zone of influence model. That's a, a factor of being able to do this sort of stuff in Co-Creek. You run multiple iterations over and over again really fast, just changing parameters, just looking and seeing how sensitive to, to things it is. The other things I've used Co-Creek for is comparing two different models. So here's an example of uh, uh, the histogram of the number of samples within 25 meters of, of a block. Okay, so this every block in the model looked at and said, whoops, sorry about that. Saying, has every every block in the model, how many samples are within 25 meters of it? And you see on this, uh, the case on the right hand side, there's a big histogram there that says about eight, a bit over 8% of the blocks have no samples within 25 meters. The model on the left has that down to about 5% of the blocks have no samples within 25 meters. Again, coming out of Co-Creek, um, just by capturing some of that data that comes out as a consequence of, of the process. Same sort of thing again, this time here looking at the uh, number of blocks where the distance is greater than a certain threshold. So the model on the left, you can see the, the uh, histogram sitting there by itself, distance greater than 25 meters, sitting down around about five, five and a half percent. The model on the right, that same thing, the distance greater than 25 meters is sitting a bit above 8%. So I start to believe the confidence in the model on the left is better than the confidence in the model on the right. And these types of metrics are very useful for looking at understanding what the risks is, is associated with the model. One of the other things that I've, I've been able to do with Co-Krieg is actually do some, some boundary or contact analysis. Something that I've always wanted to be able to do in studio, but uh, uh, always had to revert back to Azatis or, or to Supervisor or something like that to do to contact analysis in it. But with Co-Krieg, because of the speed of the estimation process and with a little bit of creative thinking, um, you can actually build a, a process to do boundary analysis. And what's more, you can get a lot more information out of it than the, the classic stuff. So here, for instance, not only can I get the average grade by distance away from contact, but I can get the median grade or the maximum grade, or I can even look at the coefficient of variation as that changes away from the contact. All those sorts of things are possible, all because you can do some very rapid estimation. I've also used it to look at um, what happens at individual blocks. So as a standard process for me these days, I spit out the top 2% of, of uh, grades estimated in my model, and uh, any blocks that have got negative estimates, and I look at the, the sample distribution for those blocks. And these two pictures down here give you something, a really indi good indication of what's going on there. So those two blocks, the red and the green block, are actually adjacent to each other. And just because of the geometry of the samples, they only share one common sample when it comes to estimation. Um, sometimes the geometry of your drilling has more to do with the quality of the model than anything else. You can also look at the impact of poorly designed search strategies. So here's another case where um, the variogram shows very strong anisotropy. The, the people doing the estimate just used a, uh, uh, a two-dimensional um, disk as opposed to a 3D anisotropy. And you can start to see the differences in the grade estimates, the slope of regression, the creeding efficiency, all those types of things, and which samples are being used for things. So, it becomes a very powerful tool for looking at that sort of stuff. I think uh, if you really haven't used Co-Creek at all in anger, then it's time to, to start looking at it. So <clears throat> coming back to my avoiding disaster, data first, geology second, search neighborhood third. They're the three big ones that I'd be looking at. Yes, we've got to get the geostats right. We have to do our variography right, all that sort of stuff. But unless we get those first three right, you're not going to get a good model. You need to be creative in your, in your analysis. You need to know your tools. You need to understand how to actually use your tools. And if in doubt, seek some help. 
and watch out for my deposit is special, my deposit is different. You know, my deposit is, is exceptional. Uh, we have the tools to do things much, much better than, than uh, we have in the past. And it wouldn't be a good presentation unless I talked about one more thing. Actually, there's two more things, but we'll talk about this one to start with. Here's some variograms, and there's the variogram model up in the, uh, the top right-hand corner. So this is out of a, a, a fairly recent report I've looked at. If you look at the model, you see that 95% of the variance is actually isotropic. So it's got three structures there, but the, the second structure has uh, got ranges of 11, 12, and 14 meters. So 95% of the total variance is actually isotropic. So what do you think about the idea of searching to the range of the variogram? Because if you search the range of the variogram here, you'd actually use an anisotropy of three to six to four. Shows how you've actually got to look at this sort of thing. One of the other, the other interesting things I noticed in this one is that the, what they call the major axis is actually the shortest axis. And that sort of always makes me wonder about the competency of people using rotations and understanding ellipses and how things all sit together. One more thing, let's have a look at those variograms one more time. So what I did was from those variograms, which were in the report, I took a look at them and thought, oh, okay, what about if I rescale them all so they're all on the same scale, both on the, the X and Y axis, and superimpose them on top of each other? And what you get is those three variograms, the major, the minor, and the semi-major, are actually identical. They're so close to being the same that uh, you may as well not have bothered doing something uh, you may as well as just, just on an isotropic variogram. So you have to look really closely at this sort of stuff sometimes. Just glancing through reports and reading things and th taking things um, as granted doesn't work. And my last example, my final example on this sort of thing, comes back to a post I put on, on, on LinkedIn a while ago, which some of you may have, may have read, my ranting post about uh, the quality of a, of a certain estimate. And here's, an here's why I was really getting annoyed by it. They use really small blocks. So in the report, they said they use six by six meter blocks with uh, uh, two by two by two sub blocks. But they didn't say that they directly estimated the sub blocks, did they? Okay. When you look at that, if you estimate two by two by two sub blocks, you get the average grade of the resource was 1.6 grams per ton. Now I reblocked that within the domains to six by six by six, fairly simple process. And just that process dropped the grade to 1.23 grams per ton. So you can see that understanding how the mineral, how your estimation process works really, really matters here. The other thing these guys did was that they chose to do inverse distance cubed estimates. Actually, they did inverse distance squared, inverse distance cubed, inverse distance to the power of five, and they also ran an ordinary Krieg. They did each one of those with the same searches, the same number of samples, all the rest of it. And if you look at the table on that top left-hand side there, you'll see the difference between the inverse distance cubed and the ordinary Krieg result. Fairly dramatic. The ordinary Krieg starts to bring the grade well down compared to the inverse distance cubed. It's a function of the inverse distance cube effectively mimicking the grade of the drill hole data itself without allow allowing for any change to support or anything like that. So these things are fairly... Uh, uh, <coughs> can be fairly tragic sometimes, these resource disasters. You can end up with companies failing on the back of them, and you can end up with reputations being fairly sullied as you go through as well. And that's the end of the presentation, folks.